last time I think the team was. He's out of town today, so I'll be hosting the talk today. And the speaker for today's session is uh, Professor Philip King. Philip King is a pioneer in both uh, fundamental and applied research in Van der Waals uh, materials, particularly known for his uh, st study on quantum Hall effects uh, in graphene. So today he's going to talk about uh, stacking atomic layers into new materials. Uh, he's the leader of the uh, Van der Waals Hyperstructures uh, project in CITM. And let's, uh, without any further ado, let's hear it from Philip. Thank you, Sagar. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, I'm supposed to give a talk on to the, uh, for, for the thrust on the CAQM every, I think, the six months, and then um, I decide what to do. Uh, I think I gave a kind of similar talk in the already uh, last semester, so I decided, all right, so rather than repeating a uh, similar talk, I will just kind of uh, try to put some open end, and maybe we can have some more discussions as well. So, uh, 
as, uh, as probably many of you know, the CIQM has served as a really good uh, platform that a lot of interesting collaborative research is going on the campus as well as MIT and Howard uh, University together. Um, we are now up for the renewal. Uh, this uh, May is, uh, May, uh, Naomi, it was, it was April or May? I think that it was May, yeah. May we have the really uh, important meetings that uh, this uh, site visit for the renewal. And uh, you will hear a lot of exciting research programs uh, developing a uh, few different roles. And uh, this is stacking atomic layers into the, uh, the new materials. And this is one of the thrusts that we have in the CIQM. Um, idea is based on that uh, we have a lot of different type of the two-dimensional materials now available uh, uh, throughout the few years of the research efforts in the field. Uh, maybe starting out probably about a little bit more than 10 years ago, the graphene was the first one that soon after the graphene one by one, we start to rediscover uh, some of this layered materials. We can carve it down or growing uh, down to monoatomic layer such that you can get ultimate quantum limits. Not only just working in this monoatomic limits, you can restack them to make these some of the functional structures. And often that at the interface of two dissimilar materials, you can find interesting uh, the new type of the physical phenomena. Now the idea is not only you just kind of work on the science, maybe we can just kind of combine this one for the sum of the applications. And um, this is an article that, uh, that I wrote together with some of the, our colleagues in the field uh, about this broad perspective of 2D materials uh, and their applications. And it was interesting enough that it was Physics Today approached us first, hey, we understand there is exciting science, but is there any something, the applications? Um, so my colleague in the uh, electric engineering, they come up with uh, some of the different device concept based on this uh, 2D materials. Um, some of them are quite kind of realizable. Uh, some of them are a bit far reaching. Um, but as far as uh, the CIQM goes, uh, the, our goal is even probably m uh, the more grand, uh, it's, it's grandier than uh, just uh, the, in terms of the device concept. Uh, we can just kind of push even further that can we actually realize more kind of quantum type of the device. Uh, whatever it is. So that's uh, the idea that a lot of uh, interesting and exciting ideas start to develop into the, uh, this team. Um, here is our team members. I don't want to kind of go over all kind of uh, details, but uh, we have uh, already worked on the uh, interesting aspect of the various different um, uh, aspect of the, this 2D material research with complementary expertise. Um, the, this is the, the figures that we use in our renewal proposals. Again, I don't want to go into the details, but uh, general idea, if I summarize, is uh, we have a lot of different expertise and different interests. Shall we combine that in terms of the 2D materials to develop the new type of the science as well as the uh, applications? Now, um, there are a few projects, the specific project uh, that we listed into the, uh, the renewal proposal. Um, I will save the dis descriptions uh, for the CIQ member who comes for the, uh, the next uh, Tuesday. We have another meetings that uh, present about what is the project about. Um, uh, so I will just kind of save that for the details. Uh, but just kind of give you a few, uh, the taste of this uh, project. Uh, the one of the projects that we got pretty much excited about is the, this issue of the commensurabilities of the two different, uh, the, uh, uh, Bundlebar's materials, a layer of the materials. Um, just uh, speaking about, say, if you have the two graphene layer, right? We can just uh, stack this the graphene layer to make the bilayer graphene. Often the bilayer graphene uh, comes as a bonus stacking, which is a basic unit of the, uh, the forming the graphite, right? So we understand the bilayer graphene itself is a very interesting system so we, we can work with. But imagine that instead of that we just put them together into the bonus stacking, we can just uh, shift in certain directions. Of course, uh, you can make a so-called AA stacked graphene, which is unstable and uh, com it cannot come into the, in the natural form. Goes, uh, by shifting small uh, distance, you can go back to the bonus stacking, which is much more stable. But imagine that not only just a shift, but you just start to rotate this uh, the layer to, against each other. And you can quickly realize, well, a certain angle that you get the so-called Moare patterns, uh, but then uh, the Moare pattern is where that you don't relax uh, these two lattice, but there might be some of the interactions, they try to relax and form the more complicated, uh, the uh, interesting structures. 
In arbitrary twist, twisting angle, of course, as a whole lattice, uh, they, 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 they lose this kind of periodicity, but they are still kind of remain as quasi-periodic, right? So what do you expect when you have just kind of arbitrary twist angle, or if you, even better, if you have the control of this twisting angle, what kind of physics do we expect? There has been some of the efforts already happening in the CIQM, uh, the efforts um, that uh, Tim Kakshiros' group actually developed a way that you can compute the electronic structures out of uh, this kind of arbitrary twisting angle between the two graphene layer or in general the, any other, uh, uh, the Van der Waals system. Uh, quite recent result coming from the MIT in uh, Pablo's group actually shows that you, like, you, can, electric, uh, the, you can detect those kind of uh, the electronic structures out of transport measurement, especially the quantum or measurement. And it seems like the theory and experiment goes quite well in, in certain level. Now, interesting part is that if you get into the, this angle is really small, uh, but yet not exactly matching each other, uh, where that you start to have the long range of this, uh, the Moare pattern start to appear, you start to think about the lattice can be relaxed into the different structures. What do you expect actually those kind of relaxations happening? How we can deal with this, uh, the uh, commensuration and incommensurability for working it out? And in a sense, this is a new dial that we have. Uh, even starting with the same material, we can just encode somewhat different type of functionality by controlling this uh, stacking method. So that's kind of one of these uh, tastes that I can just present uh, uh, among these many different projects we have um, uh, in this uh, renewal proposal. So rather than I'm going stepping through the, all these uh, different proposals, and I just kind of uh, try to, uh, uh, the, uh, I just kind of decide to pick up these uh, two projects going on in the, uh, my group that related with some of this topic um, and just kind of discuss with you that uh, the, what kind of the flavor that we will expect to see in uh, this type of the, uh, the collaborative efforts. Most of the efforts I'm going to present is uh, the collaborative efforts you are going to see. So let me start with uh, the general description of the electronic structure uh, of this uh, 2D materials. I'm showing you here that a few different 2D materials, uh, uh, the representative uh, 2D materials. Starting with the graphene, single layer graphene, this is uh, the basic material we already uh, studied quite a bit. It's a rather simple materials, only consists of the carbons uh, arranged into the, this, um, uh, the honeycomb-like structures. We know that uh, because of this honeycomb-like lattice structures, the first brilliant zone also look like the honeycombs. And if you just think about the symmetry of the lattice, which actually is, uh, there's inversion symmetry, and within the unicell there are two carbon atoms, and each carbon atom gives uh, one pi electrons to uh, form the band. In the lowest, uh, the energy uh, structure of this, uh, the graphene comes around. There's a uh, Dirac cones reside at the corner of this brillant zone, which you often we call this K and K prime valley. Although we have the six points at the brillant zones, uh, only two sets of this, uh, the, uh, the corner points are the inequivalent in terms of the uh, the, uh, considering the periodicity. So we can call this one of this K point, uh, one set of the K point is K, uh, and the other one we'll call the K prime, right? Because of the time reversal symmetry as well as inversion symmetry, however, those kind of K and K prime points, the energy is exactly the same, so we have additional degeneracy. Often we call this is valley degeneracy, right? Now, I told you that when we just put these uh, two graphene together, we can form the bonus stack, the bilayer graphene. And that's basically basic unicell to form the graphene, uh, graphite band structures. It turns out this bilayer graphene itself is a very interesting, the electronic species. Um, again, if you just look at the bilayer graphene in the bonus stack, uh, there is a inversion symmetry. So same story goes as a single layer graphene. There's band structures reside at the corner point of the K and K prime of this, uh, the valley. Uh, they, are, they should be energet energetically degenerated because of inversion symmetry and time reversal symmetry. Only the difference is now, because of the interlayer, uh, the interactions in this bonus stack, your band dispersion is not the linear anymore. It's not the direct like the band dispersion, but there's uh, the band mass actually acquires such that uh, the each of the, this point, you have the finite mass. So that's kind of big difference. Um, unlike the, the single layer graphene, however, there is a one way that you can break this inversion symmetry. In the single layer graphene, breaking the inversion symmetry is virtually impossible. Right. If you stretch in the certain directions, you will quickly find that inversion symmetry is rather robust. In bilayer graphene, basically inversion symmetry is broken 
uh, you can break the inversion symmetry by just telling that which side is of the upper layer, which side is of the, the, the lower layer, because the inversion symmetry center is in between the layer, right? So for example, if you apply the electric field or magnetic field, you can start to break this inversion symmetry and such that uh, the K and K prime point can be different. Especially when you apply the electric field in the vertical direction, it's been known that you can open up the gap in the bilayer graphene and size of the gap can be controlled by the electric field. Now there are a host of this other two-dimensional materials called the TMDC, transition metal dichalcol genide. This consists of that one metal is in the center of the unit cell, and there's a charcoal gene atoms, often the sulfur and selenium and pallidium in surround of, surround of them. But if you just kind of project this, uh, the uh, TMDC materials into 2D plane, you will see quickly that uh, that lattice structures is again that uh, approximating the honeycomb-like lattice structures. What does their band structure look like? Now, this band structure, however, is actually has a somewhat similar things as it, uh, called the hexaboron nitride. Another graphene-like the band structure, uh, graphene-like the materials, except that two carbon atom unit cell is replaced by the boron and nitrogen. And compare with the single layer graphene, obviously what happened here is, is the uh, inversion symmetry is broken in the lattice. Therefore, you should open up the gap onto the K and K prime point. Indeed, that's the case. Boron nitride is indeed uh, the uh, large gap insulator. We have to use that as a dielectric material or substrate for the most of the other 2D materials, right? Like the boron nitride, therefore, the TMDC material will open up the gap at this uh, two value point and K and K prime, and then uh, indeed they do. One big difference in the TMDC material compared with the, the rest of the three material I just mentioned is it consists of the heavy metals um, and heavy, uh, heavy, heavy atoms such as the charcoal gene atoms. Therefore, there is strong spin of coupling, which will, turns, uh, which will break this, uh, the, uh, 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 the band in terms of spin up and spin down band, or more precisely, there is spin of coupling, so you have to consider. The band will be split by the spin of coupling such that you can often have the, uh, the uh, uh, it's not exactly a light hole and heavy hole, but the bands are breaking into the, in terms of spin in this in indexes. I'm going to kind of come back to the, this, the detail structure later, but you will quickly see that very similar atomic arrangement, you will get these uh, various different type of electronic structures, and all of these things is a two-dimensional system. In past, probably within 15 years of the time frame, we start to see that a lot of exciting physics associated with this type band structure start to appear. Right. Not only you can just look at this in terms of the band structures, it turns out experimentally they are quite accessible nowadays. Right. You can create those kind of the materials by breaking or growing, uh, uh, breaking the single crystals down to monoatomic layer, or there is a the group that can grow this one, uh, this type of the mono layer using uh, chemical vapor depositions. Uh, but on the top of that, uh, you can just cleave these materials and just manipulate this material layer by layer and restack them to form this type of the quantum heterostructures with a really sharp interface, and that's possible. Not only you can just stack them, um, in principle, you can just contact them in the individual layer. So uh, you can make this the contact on individual atomic layer uh, with a very efficient contact using the specialized this, uh, recipe uh, which has been developed. The nutshell here is now, uh, like this, uh, the semiconductor quantum well structures, which have been studied uh, for many, many years, uh, probably uh, about half, uh, half century or so now, uh, you can construct a very similar the quantum heterostructures based on this atomic layer, and you can just contact them individual layer to study the, each of the structures. And that immediately give us a lot of the, uh, the material platform you can just uh, design some of the quantum structures and study their properties, right? Here's a good example. Um, in this example that I'm showing you that uh, the, we encapsulate the moly disulfide here that the white line here is a moly disulfide uh, surrounded by this, uh, the boron nitride crystals that we stack them together uh, laterally. And then um, at some point we can also insert uh, the graphene layer on the top of the boron nitride. So you can see that it's a relatively complicated structures. The reason that we just put the graphene on the top of the boron nitride is uh, to make the good contact onto the uh, moly disulfide. Uh, you need to just engineer the work functions to match that metal to the, the moly disulfide 
such that uh, electron can flow without deterring by the short barrier. Turns out those kind of work function engineering sometimes are quite difficult. Uh, depends on the, whether the semiconducting material is P-type or N-type. You have to carefully choose the right type of the materials. And moly disulfide is N-type semiconductor. Turns out graphene with the tuning of the small work function of graphene, you can make the decent contact out of it. That's why we just insert the graphene layer to make the contact on moly disulfide in this particular sample. While this, uh, the simple method, uh, the one can actually demonstrate uh, encapsulating this channel with the boron nitride has a kind of two advantage. One, basically boron nitride is extremely flat because it's atomically, uh, atomic layer system. And second, if you just choose the uh, high quality boron nitride, which actually we obtained from the, our collaborator in Japan uh, who can grow this high quality boron nitride crystals in high pressure and high temperature, then you get rid of most of this uh, trap site into the boron nitride, and that's quite important. Therefore, that when you just put this, uh, the channels encapsulating between them, there are not many external defects you can have uh, in, in these environments. So most of the defects comes from the uh, 2D material itself. Um, for example, the graphene case, because the chemical bond between the carbon atom is very strong, and you can form the graphite crystal at extremely high temperature and high pressure. Uh, often the quality of the crystal is uh, extremely good, so you can get that, uh, very high mobility samples by just encapsulating the graphene in between the boron nitride. Unfortunately, like the sample TMDC sample, like the moly disulfide, uh, the chemical bond is weaker, and they easily you can generate this, uh, say, charcoal gene vacancies, sulfur and selenium vacancies, and that point like the vacancies will degrade the uh, channel uh, quite a bit. So even for the intrinsic sample that you're creating here, you will see the mobility is not as high as the, the mobility you can get from the graphene. Uh, typically, it's a range of the <coughs> 1,000 to the 10,000 level um, without any further improvement. Uh, but nevertheless, I think this type of the mobility is already good enough uh, under the magnetic field. You can see that uh, signature of the quantum transfer, such as the Subnikov dust uh, oscillation kind of thing sets in. Yes? Uh, so the low temperature mobility is limited by the, all the impurities we have. High temperature, basically as you go to the higher temperature, electron phonon scattering kicks in, right? So that's usually that what limits the high temperature mobility, right? Okay, um, turns out that if you choose the different type of the TMD materials at this point, that, uh, that you get the different type of the mobilities. Uh, um, our favorite choice right now, right uh, nowadays, is tungsten diselenide. Uh, only the problem of this, uh, the moving to the other TMDC is, well, you have to uh, you have to work it hard to make the contact. I told you the moly disulfide we could make the decent contact with the graphene because part of the reason is that the work function of the graphene matches the uh, decent uh, the levels of the end, uh, the N type of the uh, um, conduction band. Uh, band the edges of the moly disulfide. But once you move into the other TMDC, you have to work it out in all this context. So here is a summary of this, uh, the field that people should try to make the various different way to what is the best way to make this context. Uh, the quick summary of that is it's a rather complicated and none of them is too good. <laughs> yeah, right. One thing we found uh, quite recently is that there is a way that you can also engineer this context by simply uh, rely on the Van der Waals uh, interface. And that's, uh, in a sense, uh, but not surprising because uh, the reason that contact engineering is difficult in semiconductor is, well, that not only work function, you have to work it out that what kind of in-gap state do you make when you break this chemical bond into the, the semiconductors. They tend to create this a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the gap states inside, uh, so in a lot of states uh, inside of the gap, which actually pin the fermion level such that even if you make the work function matches, often that doesn't work it out well. However, in the Van der Waals system, like this, all the uh, 2D semiconductor I'm discussing, in principle, you don't have to break the bond uh, to make the contact. So if you make the really gentle interface uh, using Van der Waals interface with noble metals to the, some of the Van der Waals materials at the surface, uh, by stamping this, uh, the uh, channels onto the contact, there's a possibility you can make the decent contact. Indeed, that's the case. So in this particular case, we just kind of lay down the platinum and. Uh, Make sure that the work function of platinum match with this, uh, uh, the work function of Van der Waals material we just laid down. In this case, it's a 
the tungsten diselenide uh, work function is around five electric, uh, not the work functions, the, uh, the valence band edge is around kind of five electric volt or, uh, below the vacuum levels. You get the decent contact. Um, we get the decent mobility. Again, the low temperature mobility is something like the 4,000 and 5,000. So it's not as high as a graphene, but under the magnetic field, especially strong magnetic field, you can approach this uh, strong quantum limit such that uh, we get start to get this kind of quantum effect appears in this uh, monolayer of the tungsten diselenide. So we know that how to make the now decent contact. Unfortunate part is uh, still, unless we improve the material quality drastically, just a pure electrical transport of realizing this material is just still um, it's not too exciting, I would say, right? Even at the 30 Tesla, we just barely get this quantum of plateau. However, there's a one thing that we can just do with this type of the experiments. It's basically going for the uh, optical measurements. So before we go to the optical measurement, let me just show you one, one type of, few type of the different type of device configurations we can realize. So uh, in this device, we just have the two tungsten diselenide samples that uh, separate by this uh, thin boron nitride, stack them together, right? Um, and then you can just do that. If the boron nitride is uh, thin enough, then we expect that some sort of tunneling happens between this uh, two uh, top and bottom layer. Well, okay, so this is kind of tunneling device, but one difference uh, that we can make is we can also put the gate on the top and bottom of the this, uh, stacks and what this gate can do is that the gate can, uh, when we apply the gate voltages, we can just uh, start tune this band of the same tungsten diselenide, uh, one up and one down, right? So in a sense, uh, the role of the chemical doping uh, typically we can do in uh, semiconductor quantum L, we can do this kind of similar doping effect, just kind of adjust this, uh, gate, uh, the band alignment simply using the gate voltages. Right, so it's a kind of tunable doping that you can create or tunable dependent uh, alignments we can create this, uh, the, uh, in this device by simply applying the gate voltage on the top and bottom gate, right? And then we can measure the tunneling in between them and we start to see the following curve. So this is a curve that we can measure uh, uh, as a function of the, the bias voltage between these two layers across the boron nitride and uh, we just kind of change the gate voltages. In the one, one place is uh, say gate voltage, top gate was 10 volt. And as you lower down to the gate voltage, that uh, the curve actually moves in this way. One thing you notice that is if I just fix the, the gate voltages, the tunneling current start to increase, but there's a peaks and decrease and increase again. So this is a typical behavior, what we call the so-called uh, the negative differential resistance, often called the NDR effect. Um, and the effect often appears whenever there is a quantum tunneling between the band to band or the resonance tunneling. It turns out in this particular case, when we have this uh, two tungsten diselenide uh, try to be aligned to each other, uh, then we can match so-called the resonance tunneling conditions such that uh, transport through the, from one layer to the other layer, you have to consider the not only energy conservation with uh, this bias voltage, but also momentum conservations uh, throughout this tunneling. Uh, such that when these two bands exactly uh, match each other, that you get the maximize, maximize the tunneling condition, which is related with this uh, peak of this uh, uh, the NDR effect, right? And of course, since we can just uh, tune this band alignment by the top and bottom gate voltages, this NDR condition can be movable by just gate voltage. And that's why you can see here that uh, we fi fix the bottom gates and changing the top gate voltage, this NDR peaks at that, that, that this yellow streaks can be tunable by just kind of top gate voltages. Tells us indeed this idea of this uh, the band alignment control with the gate voltage works in this uh, simple device. And you will see that also create this interesting effect in the optical spectrums uh, we are going to discuss. Another uh, simple but kind of interesting device we can demonstrate is uh, that uh, using the one layer of the, in this case, molydiselenide, we just put the top and bottom uh, the boron nitride is dielectric, and this we just put the two split gates. Uh, uh, this one, this experiment was not actually originally done by the Pavlos group. We just simply just uh, repeat the similar experiments. Uh, what you see here is, although this is the same channel, tungsten di molydiselenide, but just again that you put the, the gate in the dif different voltages, one positive and the other one negative, you can just 
create the one type, one side is a P type semiconductor and the other side is band type semiconductor, right? And as we all know that when you have the PN junctions between the semiconductor, this PN junction will rectify. So you see that uh, across uh, this device, when you measure IV curve, uh, bias voltage versus current, that there is a rectifying behavior, this forward bias and the reverse bias, there is no current, right? One difference here is again, this PN junction is created by the gate voltages. So simply by controlling the gate voltage, you can control this rectifying behavior by just controlling the gate voltages, right? Um, so again, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, gate, uh, the gate can tune this uh, effect. Now, what you can just uh, do is also you can just uh, look at this optical response of the, the system. For example, you can shine the light onto the, this channel. Uh, if the top gate is thin enough that we can shine the light, the light can get into the, uh, these channels, and then uh, the light comes up, and this is what you call the photoluminescent. And just looking at the photoluminescent uh, spectrum, so you can see that what is uh, the band gap energies corresponds and so on. And that's uh, not surprisingly, you can get this uh, the uh, photoluminescent. Look at the uh, similar to the what is expected from band gap. More precisely, it is uh, uh, the band gap uh, n minus of the uh, the uh, exon binding energies in detail. Uh, but also, what you can do is uh, instead of you get the photoluminescent, you can just uh, can inject electrons into the, uh, inject the current into the system. And often that injected current, or more precisely inject electron in the P side, inject, uh, elect, uh, inject electron N side, and inject a hole in the uh, P side, can recombine and kind of bring the light back, which is basically uh, electroluminescent. It turns out the electroluminescent uh, shows very similar peaks as a photoluminescent, which means that everything is happening, uh, the regions between the N or P transition regimes. Uh, we all know from the kind of simple semiconductor uh, diode stories or photodiode stories, right? Now, while this system, a single layer, then we can just uh, tuning this uh, P and N by the gate voltage is relatively straightforward. You can just kind of tweak this system a little bit different way and create the PN junctions, but kind of different flavor. So it's something like this. In this next uh, device, the, the uh, example that we have the tungsten diselenide and molydisulfide just stack together, right, vertically, and just make the contact on each of the layer. And this is a case that uh, we can view that is the PN junctions, but atomically thin transition regimes, right? Unlike the PN junction we create here, that there's a depletion regime is uh, sets up in between these uh, two gates that we have. Here, the PN junction is uh, right across this atomic layer. It's atomically sharp, the PN junction layer we can create, right? The transport in the system, you will see that, well, that's the rectifying behavior as expected, like the PN junctions, but in the detail, uh, the understanding this, the, the rectifying behavior, you need to work it a little bit harder because instead of this uh, drift diffusion motion of the typical diffusion layer, here that it's a really uh, the tunneling between this uh, atomically sharp layer. But nevertheless, in the end, we get this uh, PN junction behavior when you shine the lights, this turn into the photodiode as if it is a PN diode and so on. But to understanding the details of the transport as well as the optoelectronic process, basically the, uh, knowing that uh, detail of the quantum mechanics on this junction is quite important. Another interesting part is when you shine the light and just uh, look at this, uh, the luminescence spectrum, for example, you will see that, that uh, the optical spectrum actually contains a really wealthy structures in there. Right. For example, in this uh, the PN junction overall regimes, that you will see the typical peak coming from uh, the, uh, the photoluminescent peaks coming from tungsten diselenide or molydisulfide together. But at the same time, it's not clearly seen, shown here. If you just look at uh, very carefully, you can often see that the, uh, the optical process coming from uh, so-called this interlayer excitations uh, between this N and P type semiconductor at the bottom of this conduction band N type to the top of this uh, valence band of the p-type, right? So all this process, the optical process, often the appears into the, uh, the optical spectrum. And the hope that we have here is, uh, can we actually control this all the process uh, uh, electrically? And just to somehow tie with this electrical transport we can make on this device with some of this optical uh, process. And that's one of the important topic uh, we are just kind of pursuing in the, uh, under the CIQM uh, the project. We don't have a lot of this uh, the yet formulated story, but kind of some of the developing stories I can share with you. 
That is a story about the um, excitons. Now, exciton is uh, the basic species we uh, count as very important to understand the optical process uh, in the semiconductor. And exciton can be a typical way that we can create exciton is shine the lights on the semiconductors uh, and then completely fill the, uh, the uh, valence band, uh, make the hole, and make the electron excited in the bottom of the conduction band. And as a transient states, uh, they can be metastable. And if you just can think about this electron hole pairs, uh, and uh, can be stabilized from hydrogen like the uh, hydrogen like the wave functions uh, between them, uh, you can get this kind of metastable state often appears as a sharp peaks in the absorption uh, spectrums or the photoluminescence spectrums. And then often uh, understanding this structure is quite important to understand uh, the uh, semiconductors electronic and optoelectronic properties. One thing that uh, about this extant is that they are all kind of relatively short-lived. Uh, unless you really, really refine the semiconductors and uh, get rid of all this uh, transition, uh, transition, uh, the uh, recombine, uh, recombine centers and so on, um, usually they are re relatively short-lived, right? There has been some efforts, however, to make the dissection quite a long-lived. One way you can think about is basically form this again semiconductor heterostructures, especially double quantum and like the structures. So imagine that I have this uh, the quantum well two quantum hours there, and shine the lights and ask what is going to happen. Well, first thing is you can create the external is one of the, uh, the uh, either of the, this quantum well. And again, like the very similar story that I just mentioned in the book, uh, the external, this external can be easily recombined and just bring the lights back, right? However, there is a one way you can just create this external, uh, slightly different way, but long lived. And the way that you can think about it is that now I just bias this, uh, the quantum L such that one of the quantum L's conduction band is getting now getting close to the top of the valence band, right? In such a situation, right, when you just create the extons across this quantum L, uh, they can actually long lived because they are now getting to the very much of the ground state configuration in some sense. You don't necessarily create a lot of energies uh, to create this, uh, the extons and some, something like this. And in fact, uh, this has been one of the major efforts that in quantum well, uh, the communities try to create uh, those kind of so-called interlay extons or the indirect extons. Uh, and part of the, uh, the motivation of such a exton, uh, creating such a exton is they can be long lived. And if they long lived, if it's pumping this more of the extons into the this quantum well, exton as a composite boson, they can just condense to create the bose einstein condensations, and one may actually expect to see that interesting extant condensation uh, uh, appears in this kind of system. There has been some of the discussions that, uh, or experimental observation, indeed, you can create a lot of these internal extants, and once they get it enough to density, although it's not the ground state, they start to show some of the, this, uh, the uh, uh, spontaneous coherence uh, between this, uh, the sub of the extants may actually start kind of going to the directions of the uh, real exon condensation in this type of system. While this uh, semiconducted uh, heterostructure is a kind of good playground, one can just uh, think about creating this exon condensation. Of course, the 2D semiconductor we've just been discussing is also a, a really interesting material platform. We can just realize such a extons or the uh, composite extons that uh, we are talking about. And part of the reason is, compared with the semiconductor heterostructures, now you have the extreme quantum confinement available in this 2D semiconductor, surely because, uh, simply because they are atomically thin materials. Um, once you create the exton in this such atomically thin materials, the most of the field line is actually escaping outside of this uh, semiconducting body, such that uh, this field line travel through the vacuum, create a strong flow of interaction between the electron and holes in general, right? So you see that exciton form in this 2D material can be extremely strongly bound compared with the, the typical semiconductor, heteros uh, the exciton in the semiconductor heterostructures. But also there is um, a strong spin of coupling, I just mentioned before, and make the, this, uh, the spins uh, or the, uh, the electron bands and hole bands make the splits due to the spin numbers, and often that uh, spin uh, uh, up and spin down bands got splits, uh, 
uh, near this k or k prime point, and considering this symmetric of the k and k prime should be connected by the time reversal symmetry and the inversion symmetry, often the direction of the, uh, the spin directions of the one barely is uh, different from the, the other one. But nevertheless, uh, this uh, splitting of this, uh, the spins at uh, this k and k prime point actually allows us that uh, the spins, uh, the spin numbers often the tied with this, uh, the, uh, the orbital numbers, or k and k, the value index that we are using. And this is quite important because now in principle, just kind of using the light, especially polarized light, either the uh, clockwise or counterclockwise, the, po uh, the uh, polarized light can address and k and k prime independently, which means that by just using this from polarized light, there is a possibility we can address the spins by just using this polarized light. And that's quite important. But on the top of that, another important point is that because of the spin of, um, because of uh, the binding energy of Xn is strong, in principle that if there's another charges around, you can just make the binding onto the additional charges with the existing the extons. Often this is what we call the trions or charged extons. And depends on that whether you're working on this conduction band or on valence band, you can get this positively charged exton or negatively charged extons or the trions possible in this kind of configuration. And that's quite important because now if you want to address the um, extons or the charge uh, extons, typical exton is a neutral object and by the electrical mean is very difficult to address it. But now if they somehow make the exton charges by just using the electrical mean, we can address the, this exton uh, by just electrically such that we have the really important component to build up the optoelectronic device, right? So this is kind of uh, quite exciting news. Indeed, in the past few years, uh, this field actually evolved quite a bit, and people have been discussing that uh, how to form this excitons in there, and not only just the uh, excitons and charged excitons, even just the, you can bind these so two excitons, create the, uh, the, uh, the so-called the bi excitons. There has been some way that addressed it, even uh, the valley with uh, the, uh, uh, <coughs> the circularly polarized light, and uh, indeed, there is a discussion that once you address uh, those kind of bipolarizations of the certain 2D materials, you may actually get a quite long extant lifetimes in the, the heterostructures. So there has been some of the ingredient that is uh, strongly indicating that uh, using this, uh, the 2D materials as a basic ingredient of the, uh, the realizing the electronics and optoelectronics in the system. Now, the easiest combination we can just do that is I already demonstrated we can create the electronic device and then there's a optical spectrums there. So the first uh, test we can do is, can we actually control this optical spectrum? Again, using the gate voltage, right? So here's the, uh, uh, the quick answer. So here is, uh, this one is tungsten diselenide that we make the contacts and we have the, this uh, gate. Um, it's not clearly showing here in this one because the gate is so thin such that we can, the light can penetrate it. But cross-sectional images show that here is tungsten diselenide that make the contact by this uh, the, the, uh, electrode. And there's a bo uh, the boron nitrate top and bottom, and we have the, the bottom gates and top gates. So we have the two set of gates that can uh, make in this device. So why we need two sets of gates? Uh, you will see in, in a moment that the why two set is quite important. One thing we can do is uh, we can shine the light onto the, this 2D channels and we can just get the spectrum of this, uh, the photoluminescent. And peak in the photoluminescent often tells us which, uh, what kind of things we have. I mean, we expect that there's extons, maybe there's a trions, a positive charged trions, negatively charged trions. And often also there are some of the defects in this material also appears as uh, some of the peak in the photoluminescent, which is correspond to the uh, trapped extons or trapped uh, the trions and those kind of things, right? Indeed, when we shine the light, so we get the spectrums. Um, here that uh, this is the energy of the photoluminescent, uh, and this uh, reddish color, yellow and reddish color is basically where the, you get the strong luminescence. So if you look at there, there's one peaks there, and there's a three peaks in this regimes, and there's another peaks. And that can be controlled by just charge density we just create in there. Now, we have the top and bottom gates. So basically changing top gates or bottom gates, so we can also change the carrier density inside of sample, right? But at the same time, if I just kind of put the opposite voltage in the top and bottom gate voltages, we don't necessarily change the carrier density, but then, then we can only just change the displacement field, electric field in the vertical direction of the channel, 
right? So combination of these two gates, we can control the electric field into the channel as well as the density and the channel separately, right? And what you see here is that just that when we fix the electric field and only change the, the, the gate voltages, uh, the, uh, the density in the channel, you see that all this spectrum we are seeing is uh, rather sensitively changing. It turns out this range is uh, near the, the gap. So inside the, uh, the, when your Fermi level is uh, within the gap, such that this semiconductor is uh, 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 close to intrinsic, we get the multiple peaks. And presumably all the extant peaks is reside only inside the gap. And when you just drag your, uh, the Fermi level outside of the gap, such that when you get into the conduction band or valence band, uh, basically you quickly extinct uh, these extant peaks. And then so-called the try and peak is uh, prevailing in this device, right? Okay, so that's, uh, that's already interesting, but what is more interesting part is following. How do I know that this is a strictly two-dimensional object? One thing you can tell that is from this, uh, this graph, where that I'm just uh, showing that how the peak got changes as a function of the electric field at fixed density, right? This is possible that by just combining these two, two top and bottom gate voltages. What you see here is uh, basically this peak uh, intensity, the photoluminescent intensity got modulated as a function of electric field. And because of photoluminescence is a rather dynamic process we have to think about, so intensity, uh, in the intensity itself depends on the various different process into the channel. What is important part is, is energy. Energy is a dead lock onto the, the same energies. It does not depend on peak position itself, does not depend on the electric field, right, in, in the vertical direction. And this immediately tells us there is no really uh, the fixed dipole moments associated with, which actually turns as in, comes as energies in the outer plane directions, means that all this kind of dipole moment of this, what we are dealing with here is inside of this plane and tells us that whatever dealing with here that giving us the spectrum is completely two dimensional object we have. Right. So this experiment was uh, recently done in combination of the my group's efforts with Hong Kong Park and Michelle Lukin, start to give us that good sense that how we can address uh, this uh, two-dimensional optical species in the electrical means, right? We can actually go one step forward. Yes. Uh, well, on the right. On the right. Okay. So I think uh, this. Uh, well, we, we don't know whether this is a really, so I think this the traditional naming is based on the previous studies and people just claim this is, uh, there, are, there are few extant species or the uh, charged extant species. Or some of them, we are reasonably sure that it's kind of extant. Some of them, we are not sure that what, what they are. And somehow people call this is a surface bound extants and so on. But uh, detailed study need to be done by just kind of looking at the, all these uh, transition dipole moments and so on. But at this point, uh, it is simply just a naming. Um, look like that there is some of the defect associated with the things there, but yeah, beyond that, I don't know what, uh, what I should say. Good point. Yeah. Mm. This one, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think that we have the real good explanation. Again, the peak, peak, uh, the intensity changes is a little bit dynamic process and you have to know the detail of the dynamic process um, to explain the why the uh, peak intensity got changes in one uh, versus the other one. Yeah. So expanding this effort a little bit, I think this is again the uh, collaborative efforts between the three groups and mostly led by the Hong Kong Parks group. Uh, you is the main, uh, the main characters that led these efforts. It's the following things. In this example, then now the device is already more complicated, but it's look at, uh, it gave us kind of interesting uh, the insight there. So again, this one is uh, tungsten and diacetyl and I encapsulate in between the boron nitride. But instead of just put this into the silicon wafer, now uh, you actually put this one into the silver. And silver is uh, structured in such a way there's a trenches in there. And the reason that the silver is being used is uh, we know that silver, especially single crystal silver that uh, uh, the Parks group can grow, uh, can carry these plasmons in the extremely long distance with the, the small damping. So this is a kind of good carrier, so especially when shine the lights onto the, the silver surface, that you can just launch the plasmon, surface plasma in the silver, but this surface plasma is in a sense that it carries along with its electromagnetic wave uh, at the, uh, at the uh, boundary between the silver surface and to the vacuum. And often this is called the surface plasma polariton in that regard. 
So there's always kind of light, uh, elements of the light associated with that, right? What is interesting part is when you experiment is when you shine the light onto the, this uh, uh, tungsten diselenite and just look at the photoluminescent. Basically, this is uh, uh, tungsten diselenite. This is silver surface, and there is a slit. You can see that uh, the light comes back. It's a photoluminescent one can measure, but at the same time, if you just look at there. Uh, away from this, uh, this uh, the light part, away uh, from the samples, at the, the, the trench of the, this made onto silver, start to brighten up. And the reason that away from this uh, the sample uh, and this, uh, the, the slit side brighten up is that light carried by the surface or the, uh, the energy carried by the surface plasma polariton. In other words, the surface propagation of the light electromagnetic wave which, carry, uh, which got excited by this far field irradiation in the center of the sample, start to emit back at this, uh, the uh, trench of the silver as a scatter that appears in the, this plasma uh, uh, polariton uh, species. Right? In fact, looking at the spectrum here, we we'll also carry the information that generate this all the optical species there. It's quite interesting that if you just look at this PR peaks, you see that many features appear there but there are more features up here. So in this blue curve is the, the far field irradiations, uh, far field detection of this, uh, the, uh, the photoluminescent. You can see that this is the uh, trion peaks and X0 is X some peaks I was discussing before, uh, higher energies and lower energies there, right? But then surface plasma polariton carries it, it not only the two peaks, uh, but also additional peaks, right? And for now, this one is L1 is uh, like previously I mentioned as uh, this is, uh, the surface bound, right? Likely kind of defect associated. But on the top of that, there is a the new peak appears which is not appeared at all in this uh, far field or uh, the far field uh, photoluminescent. It turns out this new peak is precisely related to so-called dark extons. And dark extons uh, actually is related with the interesting the spin splitting that I discussed before at the each of the valley, right? Because of this spin splitting, right? Considering, considering the, uh, if you just look at this, all the optical transitions, some of the transition is not allowed uh, when the, the uh, electromagnetic wave components is in plane of this, uh, 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 this two-dimensional system. And it only appears or, uh, when you have the, this uh, transition dipole is out of plane. And uh, when you just create this surface plasma polariton, you can create this electric field or magnetic field out of plane directions. And that will can couple with so-called this dark axiton components, which is not allowed in far field irradiation, can be brightened up and shows up into the, this, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the photoluminescent appears at the trench sides of the uh, silver. And this type of this experiment already starts to show that once you create this interesting device type, uh, you can just control the uh, irradi uh, the the uh, the luminescent appears in this system. And further, just kind of carrying out this idea, if you just engineer this uh, surface plasma uh, wave or the propagation of this one by just kind of uh, uh, the uh, engineering of the dielectric on the surface, you can even guide. That, that uh, or this information carried by the dark extons in the certain way that we can just do that. And that's quite important because dark exton, as the name indicating, is a rather inert that into the just kind of typical far field condi uh, uh, com uh, conditions. But since the DC, this one also carries all the spins and the valley information, you can encode those kind of information in dark exton. And in principle, you can actually carry out this information into the surface by the engineering. Uh, and the long leaf, and that's quite in, uh, exciting, the new opportunity we have onto the, this type of the system. I think uh, uh, it's one hour, right? Or one and uh, five. Five. five more minutes, right? So, okay, so that's, uh, that's a part. All right, so I think that I probably skip onto the, this one briefly mentioned. But this already started to give us um, interesting opportunities, simply just using the uh, optical species that combined with to this system um, already kind of this uh, very initial pro, uh, the results can give us quite of the promise that how we can engineer this kind of uh, the optical species or extons into the system. 
However, we are still kind of far uh, to create this, uh, the grand dreams of the creating exon condensations. Part of the reason is uh, that all these optical species we created is still um, just not a ground state properties. It's all kind of still uh, excite, uh, excited uh, state properties. Before I just close down, I will give you one more example, uh, the kind of quick exam example. Um, in other type of the two-dimensional system, however, it has been demonstrated that one can create the excitons in the ground state properties and create so-called excitant condensation. That was done through this, again, uh, the bilayer system, but it's not just the semiconductor bilayer. Uh, it's uh, like the quantum Hall bilayer system. Idea is basically uh, when you have this uh, two quantum Hall bilayer with two partially filled lambda level, you can just think about this is like the two band uh, separated in some distance. But just to correlate these uh, two partially filled lambda levels by the, uh, the exchange correlation, you should be able to form the like the exon like the species. And if you have a lot of these things can create it, then you can just create so-called the exon, uh, the magnet exon condensation. And that has been studied into the quantum or bilayer, like the Jim Eisenstein is a really, Jim Eisenstein and Caltech is a real pioneer. They're showing that those kind of species, uh, the signatures appears as so-called the quantized whole drag or the perfect counterflow, uh, uh, perfect drag uh, in the counterflow geometries and so on, right? What we can bring into the, this idea is, again, if you just use a two-dimensional system, you can bring it to the even more extremes. Quite recently, that we've been start, uh, starting doing this one, realizing to the graphene bilayer, and uh, we start to see that indeed, like this, uh, the quantum or bilayer that created in gallium arsenide, we start to see that the uh, quantized drag signals, and uh, also uh, the uh, perfect drag signals, and indicating that we are creating this magnetic exciton condensations. More exciting news, however, here is, uh, indeed, not only we can create uh, those kind of magnetic con uh, exciton condensation in half field lambda level, of the bottom of the half field lambda level, but turns out this type of things appears many different lambda levels. For example, that you can create the, this, uh, the magnetic drag, uh, the quantized magnetic drag between that uh, uh, half field lambda level and the two and half field lambda level, or uh, different type of the uh, lambda levels. Furthermore, this condensation can be controlled by just controlling the pseudo spin components by applying the gate voltages, which means that this magnet external we're creating has internal structures, and by external ex experimental control of this internal uh, control of this extons, we can create uh, sometimes condensation between them or non condensations between them, and so on. I think this type of the tunability is another exciting part. All right, so I think I don't have the time to go or, uh, go through this one, but again, um, I will just kind of close on with the, the slide. Uh, so idea the, the, in the CIQM is, the, again, that we have this all this two-dimensional system. It is a quite diverse. Some of them are semiconductor. Some of them are like the graphene is a kind of perfect two-dimensional, uh, very good two-dimensional electron gas. I have skipped out all these quantum uh, uh, superconductors uh, tied with another themes that we have in the CIQM with the, these topological superconductivities. Also, there are in good ingredients we can use in two-dimensional system to realize these interesting uh, superconductivities. So um, based on this, a lot of material platform, you start to see there already some sense that what kind of interesting the physics we can also explore, not only physics, but also you start to see that really the first step kind of first doorway steps to going to the uh, interesting application. I think that's all probably I want to say today. Thank you. Give some spaces between them. And so yes, indeed, that, that was the idea that we tried uh, briefly. We didn't get too much of the lock to get this, uh, the interlay actions or interlay triangle forms across the thin layer of the boron nitride. Right? But uh, uh, we have not done that really systematic way yet. 
So um, that's interesting, interesting proposals there. Indeed, uh, if you just chalk off the uh, tunneling between these uh, two layers, um, whatever species, if the charge, tri uh, charge X and X should be long lived. But on the other hand, uh, maybe you just uh, weaken the interactions between them uh, simply because it's a distance. So there must be some sort of optimization is needed. At this point, there's just a quick uh, trial of the space based search. We didn't have too much of the luck to create this uh, interlayer uh, extant species uh, across this uh, thin layer of the world. Yeah. Can yeah. uh, there be any experimental methods to observe isocarbon wave function directly? Direct observation of the extant wave function, not that I know. Right. Um, let's see. Uh, no, not that I know that uh, there is a way that people just directly observe external wave functions. Of course, there are a lot of calculations um, and the bound, binding and the calculations and so on. At this point, the most of the external study is done by the optical means, so it's not easy to just image the wave functions. Um, in principle, that some sort of semi flow techniques, the same type of techniques in combination with the, the, uh, the optical access. One should imagine to just do this type of things, but not that I know that uh, the uh, observation of the direct wave functions. So trials, I guess, exotiles are both of Yeah. I think uh, trials is, is a three species and the spin half and three is most referrals. I don't think it will be condensed, but who knows? Are there yeah. any interesting debates that not that I know, but I think you can imagine that while triumphs as a composite fermions, they may actually form some kind of group of pairs or do something, so who knows, right? I and mean, we can dream on that, right? Uh, tri Trion itself is kind of interesting species in a sense. Uh, the question that one can ask is, what is the mass of the trion if you form the triumphs, right? Um, uh, and the simplest answer is, well, three times of the electron mass, but uh, ele or electron whole mass plus another electron mass. Uh, but uh, there must be interactions so start to renormalize the mass, right? Um, the, uh, using just a left, but uh, uh, there is even this claim that you cannot call this as a trion. Oh, there, here we go. <laughs> right. you maybe call the charged external. It may not be just kind of really uh, kind of quartz particle nature. It's maybe some sort of, uh, 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 what is a better way to say that? Uh, Extemplaritons. Plurons, yeah, plurons, yeah. So there's kind of somewhat different view. I mean, we simplify that uh, the, the triumphs, but what is the nature of this one is also kind of intriguing. Um, we are now right at the really starting point because we have the, our control of the gate voltages, which actually is a good tool to control the triumphs. Charge the plurons. All right, that should be good for today. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.